Today, we are going over simulation and state elaboration. So we're taking an, an HSC and we are kind of walking through every possible simulation in order to get a representation of the state space that we can then use to uh, synthesize production rules. So uh, luckily we have some automated tools to do this so we don't have to do it by hand. Uh, unlike the last two lectures, uh, we are getting into the uh, kind of the purview of the tool set called Haystack, which is partially developed uh, and quite reliable for uh, at least this lecture, and we'll talk through its shortcomings for the others. So previously, we've taken a collection of communicating hardware processes. We have uh, kind of expanded them into two-phase CHP, and then we've gone further into uh, expanding them out and reshuffling them into handshaking expansions. So this HSC that we're looking at is just uh, kind of a straightforward HSC for a weak condition half buffer, but you can do this for any HSA, any HSC you would like. There are two more steps we need to take after expanding these out. The first step is to add uh, some exist some initial rules for reset. So for variables that are driven by the process, you need to kind of drive their values before entering the main loop. And then for variables that are not driven by the process, you need to wait for them to uh, have their uh, associated value that you kind of are assuming on the environment. So with the first example, why is the wait for LE and L.R minus swapped positions? Does that matter? Uh, it doesn't matter whether or not they're swapped. They can be any order. Uh, any number of transitions outside the loop here will be rolled up into the reset state. So the next thing that we have to do is we have to tell the simulator uh, which, kind of where are the process boundaries? And so we do this with uh, what are called isochronic regions. Effectively, we tell the simulator that this is in isochronic region zero. We just do that by leaving it alone. And then we tell the simulator that these two are in isochronic region one. Uh, and so that's the environment. Now, if these two were to communicate, you'd probably need to split them up into different isochronic regions as well, but they don't, so you can kind of overlap them. Uh, so isochronic regions are effectively like uh, transitions, uh, local, observation of a given transition is different than remote observation of a given transition. Uh, and so we need to be able to handle that. So uh, you can take this uh, HSC and you can run it through HSC SIM. And so uh, you just call HSC SIM on the, on the HSC file. You can look at the set of reset states by using the reset command, and then you can pick one and then step through this simulation and it'll uh, walk through kind of uh, transition by transition. And we will show you how that works. Uh, and then we'll walk through an example. So the, the other thing that you can do is uh, generate a kind of a visualization of the graph that it's working through. And this graph is, uh, is using kind of an underlying representation called a Petri net. It was invented to uh, kind of represent uh, chemical reactions, actually, uh, throughout uh, uh, chemical processes. And, and it's been kind of expanded out into any general computational uh, representation. Today, we're just going to be showing a uh, straight line uh, HSE. So you won't be able to see all that, all that much when it comes to uh, parallel or conditional logic. Uh, but suffice it to say that conditional uh, splits happen on places and parallel splits and merges happen on transitions. And so we have two types of transitions. Uh, we have guards and we have assignments like you would in an HSE. Okay, the first thing that you should notice is that uh, we have these initial markings here, right? And so if we go back and we look at our HSE, uh, you'll notice that the loop starts with L.R up here. It starts with this guard on R.E and L.R, and it starts with this guard on R.R. 
our initial marking uh, starts with the guard on L.R and R.E, e, as you'd expect here. Starts with the guard on R.R, dot R, which matches here. But here it starts with a guard on L.E. dot e. It has been moved backward actively by the simulator uh, because guards are actually not real transitions. And we need to make sure that we properly handle the guard going into the first transition after reset. So the next step is uh, we have generated our kind of initial state encoding. So not only do we have the initial token on each uh, process, but we also have uh, an encoding of the value of each variable in each process. And so, and it's it's based upon what each process knows about the state of the whole system. So the source only knows about LE and LR. Those are the only two observable signals. The buffer knows about LE, LR, RR, and RE because it can observe those four signals. And the sync only knows about RR and RE. So this matches the initial state that we had specified here and here. It's been rolled up from these statements. So we've done our setup. Now we can start walking through the simulation. So the first step is to figure out which transitions are enabled. And if we look through this HSC, we can look at the state and see, all right, L.E and that L.R are the current state. This guard is waiting for L.E to be high. It is already high. So this guard is enabled, right? It's allowed, the token is allowed to pass through it. Um, but the, the guard isn't a real transition. So we simply extend the token through the guard to get to L.R up. So L.R up is enabled. It has not fired yet. This token is waiting on L.R and R.E. L.R is currently low, R.E is currently high. So this guard is not enabled. This token is waiting on R.R. R.R is currently low, so this guard is not enabled. So currently we can only fire one transition, and that is here, L.R going up. Uh, once we fire, L dot R up. We also then know in new information about, about L dot E. However, we already knew that information. So the only thing that changes is L dot R goes from zero to one in this process. But then we also lose information about, about L dot R in any uh, communicating process. And the reason for that is because we don't actually know the delay on the wire for L dot R between these two processes. We do know that it is that it will eventually monotonically transition from zero to one, but we don't know when that will happen. And we can't verify that has happened until after we pass to the guard waiting for that to happen. And so when we execute this transition, this token moves from this position through the guard, through the assignment and over to here. Our, under, our knowledge of L.R locally transitions from zero to one. Remotely, our knowledge of L.R is lost. We no longer know its value. And we have executed this partial production rule, L.E drives L.R high. Okay? Any questions about that transition? Right. So the next transition that is enabled is this token. So now L dot R is unknown. It could be zero or one. R dot E is known to be one. And so we can pass through this guard and drive R dot R high. Now this is the only transition that is enabled in the system because R dot R and R dot E still hasn't changed yet. For this token, we're still waiting for L.E to be low, 
L dot E is high, so we can't execute that transition. So in executing this transition, R dot R goes high here. We learn the current value for L dot R. We have, we have verified that the transition from the communicating process has reached the buffer. Uh, and then now as a result, know that L dot R is high. Now, because we've driven R dot R high in this process, it goes from zero to one, but then we lose information about it in this process. And so now there are two possible transitions that we can make that are enabled. So this is where kind of ex possible executions can split uh, and we get different orderings. So then we choose a, uh, a transition to execute next. Uh, we execute the lower one down here, driving R dot E low. And so locally, um, R dot E is driven. So we, this token passes through the guard on R dot R, and then R dot E is driven low. And so in this process, we know that R dot R is high as a result of the guard. We know that R dot E is low as a result of the transition. And we've lost information in this process about R dot E. And we've executed the next partial production rule. This still leaves L dot E going low enabled. And so we can execute that. Doing so drives L dot E low in this process locally. We lose information about L dot E in the source. Uh, and now uh, we can pass through this guard and drive L dot R low. Uh, we can keep doing this. And, and step through the simulation one step at a time, executing our way back to kind of the initial state. And so any ordering that we take through that, we have to make sure to simulate in order to elaborate the whole state space. What we can do is then take for every token uh, that we've seen, right, we can take these the state encoding that we saw in that location and or it in with all of the other state encodings that we saw at that location. So this generates the predicate space. Basically, we get for each place in the Petri net a some understanding of all the possible state encodings seen in that place. All right, so we can generate the predicate space um, by calling HSC sim to elaborate the state graph, saving it into uh, an asynchronous signal transition graph, and then plotting the predicate space into a PNG file. And she, so you can see at each place, we have uh, a given predicate. Now, this isn't enough to uh, synthesize production rules, because if we look at a given predicate, we'll find that uh, the same state encoding exists across multiple places. So if we look here, for example, the predicate for this, uh, for this place is L dot R is low. The predicate for this place is L dot R is low and L dot E is high. So if L dot E was high here, we would have already passed through this guard and we would be in this place because guards are not real transitions. So this brings us to the effective state space, the effective predicate space in which we take the guards, all, you know, all the transitions on the output of the place and we invert the effect that they have on the state and and it into the predicate space. So now this place, the effective predicate for this place is not L dot E and not L dot R, because if L dot E were high, we would have already been in this place. So we have a predicate now for every place. And 
assuming that none of these conflict with each other, you can look at any given assignment and then look at the predicate leading into this that assignment. And if you want to, you can use that as a production rule. It will be overly specified because it uses it, it's far more information about the state of the system at that place than you actually need in order to write a production rule. But it will be a functional production rule if there are no conflicts between these. Now we will talk about state conflict identification and state variable insertion uh, in the next lecture. Uh, but for today, we're just looking at the uh, state elaboration and uh, simulation processes. And so if you want to, you can actually visualize this as a state space as well. Uh, and, and this is what it looks like. All three processes have been kind of merged together. And uh, you'll see an individual encoding at each one of these states. Unfortunately, HSC Sim has a couple of bugs when generating the state space sometimes. So this one is correct, but other ones may not be. Um, ultimately, you generally don't want to use the state space because uh, you run into state space explosion. This representation avoids that entirely. OK. So that's. Uh, that concludes the content for the lecture. Any questions before we jump into the examples? There are a couple of, um, of arcs where the arc is labeled with a guard. And so if we are reading out and then transfers to an assignment, you can see how that produces a production rule. When you have something like um, not L dot E and not L dot R, and then transitions to the guard L dot E and then L dot E and not L dot R, and then there's an assignment. So how would those two preceding uh, predicates be used to produce production rule? So you would actually ignore the predicates for the guards because all the information for the guard is encoded in the predicate before the assignment. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, guards, the, the basic concept here is that guards aren't real transitions. They're just an assertion on the current state of the system. So we can pick a, an HSC from one of our previous lectures. Uh, let's take a look at lecture 13, uh, the one that we kind of went through a full elaboration for a half adder for. So we can take this, pull it out, and paste it in. The next thing that we need to do is set up the environments for this HSC. Uh, before running simulation. So let's do that. Uh, our first environment, remember from the, uh, from this example, we have two input channels and two output channels, A and B and S and C of. So let's take a look at the uh, ex at the source for A. So for A, we want to drive either A.F or A.T high. Uh, and we want to do that when uh, A.E is high. Uh, this is going to be an active, um, an active handshake expansion, right, an active protocol. So we're just going to drive uh, a.f high. Now, we also want to randomly drive a.t high, and there's a syntax in HSC to do that, which is we create a conditional statement 
we give it a guard of one, so it's always true. And that drives a dot f high. And then we give it a non-deterministic selection using the colon with another guard of one to drive a dot t high. So that will pick one or the other randomly. We then wait for a dot e to go low before driving both a dot f and a dot t low. Then we wait for a dot e to be high and we close off our loop. So this is an example of a uh, kind of random one bit source E, you know, uh, E1 of 2 source. Of course, we haven't done reset yet or isochronic regions. Let's take a look at an example of a one bit sync. So let's sync S. We're going to wait for either S.T or S.F. Then we're going to drive s dot e low. Then we're going to wait for both s dot f and s dot t to be low per the neutral state. Then we're going to drive s dot e high. So that is a one bit sync on s. And we're just going to replicate these across uh, to b and to co. But let's first do reset so we can copy that over as well. Okay. So to reset the source, we're going to assume that a dot e is already high on reset, and we're going to drive a dot f low and a dot t low. on reset. For the sync, we're going to assume s.f is low and s.t is low, right? We're going to assume a neutral state in the pro in the uh, request rails. And then we're going to drive s.e high. In the adder, we're going to assume that all of our input requests are low. We're going to drive all of our input enables high. We're going to drive all of our output requests low. And we're going, going to assume that all of our output enables are high. Right, so this is standard reset for WCHB. So uh, A dot F is going to be low. A dot T is going to be low. B dot F is going to be low. And B dot T is going to be low. S dot E is going to be high. CO dot E is going to be high. Then we're going to drive our input enables low. So A dot E, or sorry, high. So A dot E is going to be high. B dot E is going to be high. And we're going to drive our output requests low. So s.f is low, s.t is low, co.f is low, and co.t is low. Okay. Let's take this, uh, the source for A, and let's re replicate it over to B. We're going to take the sync for S and replicate it over to CO. Then we're going to identify isochronic regions. Specifying that S and CO 
and A and B, all of those sources are, and sinks are in our environment. And we want to compose these in parallel, ultimately. Okay. So we have our HSC for a one bit half adder. So now we can take this and run it through HSC SIM. And take a look at the reset rules at the current reset state. Right, so that's that's what all of the variables in the system will be reset to. Notice that there are separate variables for different isochronic regions. And this is because the knowledge of their value is actually different. Right, we, we literally have a different variable for each side of the wire. Right, and you can have multiple isochronic regions and a variable span all of those isochronic regions. You will have a different variable for each end of that wire effectively. So we only have one possible reset state. Sometimes you can have multiple depending upon what uh, operations you put leading into that loop. So we're going to reset it to uh, state zero. If you want to see all the commands that are possible, you type help. And this shows you what you can see. If you want to see the tokens that uh, are currently set up, you can uh, use T or tokens. And this will show you where each token is in the system. All right. Now these uh, labels here, P3, P5, P9, P11, these are different places. And I will show you where they point when we uh, use uh, plot. Okay, we can then see which transitions are enabled using E. So right now, either B.T can go high, B.F can go high, A.T can go high, or A.F can go high. And we can choose which one we want to set high using fire or F. So let's fire, let's drive a dot F high, so fire free. So that production rules fires. We can take a look at our current tokens. Whereas previously we had a token, tokens here. Uh, that is now, has now been evaluated and we have our token here. Right, we've passed through this. We're not in this place waiting for A.E to be low. We can see our next set of enabled transitions in the ones that we have in parallel. Already, we know that CO.F can go high. Remember, that is our early out. We are still waiting on BF and BT. If we want to step randomly through this, we can choose some number of transitions. So we can use the step command or S. So we can just step through a hundred transitions and we run into an instability. Now, why have we run into that instability? Let's take a look. The first thing that we fired was A.F high, B.F goes high, CO.F. We execute a set of transitions. We see the output enables go low. We see the output requests reset. The input enables go high. The output enables reset. And we get a new set of input tokens. So we've gone through a whole cycle here from here to here. 
we see a transition on our output enables here and here and our and our input requests here and here and then co.t goes high co.e goes low and co.e is allowed to go low before s.f goes high and that's what causes the trend uh actually hold on yes so co.e is allowed to go low before s.f goes high and that's what causes the instability so if we take go back and take a look at our hsc we see here that both s.f both our our output requests on s and our output requests on co are gated are guarded on s.e and co.e so because s our output requests on s are guarded by co when co is driven low as a result of acknowledgement on this on our output request on co then we get a glitch and so we can fix that by only waiting for s.e in our guards for s and only waiting for co.e in our guards for co Okay, let's try this again. So okay. we've run into another instability, this time on S.F going low, and it's going to be a very similar thing. So if we take a look at our HSC, we're waiting on, on both the output enables for s.e and co.e before driving s.t low and co.f low, right? So all the output requests on s and the output requests on co wait for both s enable and co enable. And so we can adjust this again by waiting for only s.e in, uh, in the output request for s.s and only co.e to go low in the output requests for co. Now, notice that we've moved our guards for s.e and co.e across, basically over this guard for all of our input requests. And we're able to do that because a guard is not a real transition and two guards in sequence are the same as one guard with all of them anded together. Okay. Now let's see what happens. All right, we've been able to execute 100 transitions. Let's try a bunch more. Let's try 10,000. 100,000, 000. all right, it looks like our system is stable. We can verify that by running through a full elaboration of the state space. So we can call hscsim-eg, we're gonna save this into, uh, let's call it e1.astg, and we're gonna run it against e1.hsc. And so it runs through the entire state space pretty quickly. And we generate the ASTG. And it's basically just a dump of the state space in a graph. OK. If we now we can plot this, so if we say plot uh, e1.astg and save it to e1.png, I'm going to open that up. 
Now, this isn't rendering any of the labels for any of the states, and it's not rendering any of the predicates. It's just rendering kind of its view on the uh, on the HSE. So we have two sources. We have our half adder, and then we have two sinks. So let's take a look at the predicate space and put this off to the side here. Okay, I'm going to run the same command, except this time, instead of just plotting E1, I'm going to plot uh, with the dash P flag. And that renders the predicate space into E1.png and zoom in. And so you can start to see why you wouldn't want to use some of these predicates as production rules. They get kind of big. And this is even with kind of uh, logic simplification here, where we're trying to, uh, we try to build, build a logic tree here uh, to make our lives simpler, but it's still pretty big. Okay, let's render the elaborated um, effective predicate space with dash E. So this simply ends in the inverse of the guard to the predicate. And now this is what we can use to generate production rules. Can you show us what the state space thing would do if you don't have a stable um, a stable system? Or does it just error out? Uh, it errors out, but I believe it still produces a result. I mean, okay. E1.hsc. And let's uh, add our instability on s.e and co.e back in. So we're just going to put that in here and not SFE and not CO.E. And we're going to remove it from here. Okay. We're going to rerun the collaboration. And it generates a ton of instabilities. Basically, all the different possible orderings of all the instabilities. Um, but it still generates the ASTG. Now you're not going to be able to tell from the AST from the plot of the ASTG that there are instabilities because it's hard to tell from just the state encodings that there's a given instability in the system. And so you really want to keep keep an eye on these assignment unstable assignment messages. So we have three processes, or we have separate processes, and the internal state uh, communicates across synchronization points. Combined state space, so the, um, the last is structure. Uh, so here, in the combined state space, should we be able to pick out where the synchronization uh, points occur between the processes? So you're looking for interleavings of transitions on the requests and the enable of a given channel, right? So uh, for example, here on R, uh, we see R dot R go high here. We see it go low here, here, and here, basically walking across that parallel cube. Then we see it go low. We see R dot R go low here. And we see R dot E go high here, here, and here. Again, walking across that parallel transition cube. On the combined state space, can we pull out? Okay, we did without tracing. Yes, yeah, so we should be able to pull out the individual processes themselves. So you pull out individual processes by looking at 
the only the the composition of a subset of variables, right? Um, and unfortunately, the moment that you hit a parallel block, you get this like diamond hypercube thing with all of the parallel operations in different orderings. I see. Okay, so then when we go cross a when we move across a parallel uh, section of the combined state space, we're actually looking at something that can be uh, collapsed. Yeah. So if so, the reason the reason that this tool stays away from the state space like this is because if you have two things, two sequences of transitions in parallel, then the number of states you need to represent that is the, the multiply of the number of transitions in those two sequences. If you have three in parallel, it's the multiply of those three and four, so on and so forth. Um, and so you actually get what's called state space explosion. Effectively, fairly simple systems can have millions and millions of possible states. I can see that can happen. And I don't uh, really expect the tool to be able to like reduce that complexity because it's it's like it's not full complexity. It's it's not full complexity. I think the crux of it is mostly in in keeping so in looking at the individual processes and in tracking the information which is local to each process. Uh, then building a mental model for when those, uh, when information transfers from one process to the next, and seeing if the tool can help with that, or to what extent the tool can help with that. If it isn't the case, then it has to be something which is like pencil and paper and in your, in your head, and that's fine. Um, you're asking if we can render the synchronization transitions basically render the arcs from, from one of these assignments to one of the guards? I think that's what I'm asking. So an assignment can affect multiple guards and it doesn't always have to affect a given guard every time. Also a guard can be affected by multiple assignments in an HSC and doesn't always have to be affected by a given assignment every iteration. Which means that it's it's kind of difficult to draw these arcs because they're 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 a little e ephemeral. And yes, okay. And so our representations are conservative. They show us the um, information that has to be present for a transition to occur, not all transitions that could occur. Also, keep in mind that this represent this representation of the state space, because it's hiding remote information about parallel orderings, it can much easily, much more easily trim the, um, the, the execution tree, right? Because you'll get much larger overlap in the state encodings, in the local state encodings versus the whole system state encodings. And so this sees this has to visit exponentially fewer states in order to elaborate the entire state space. 